Hi, Rashonda Kate here. It's Rashonda's Reading Room. We are reading Hagar's Daughter by Pauline Hopkins. We did the first part of chapter 10 last time, so we're going to finish chapter 10 this time. So I'm going to dive in. The Bowens are in town. That meant a vast deal to the important section of Washington's world, which constitutes society, for the splendid mansion closed since the daughter's brief introduction to society, it was rumored, would be added to the list of places where one could dance, dine, and flirt. Ooh. Festivities were, open, were to open with a ball, a marvel of splendor for which 500 invitations had been issued. 500? Wow. Senator Bowen was walking down the avenue the next afternoon on his way home when he was joined by General Benson, who had developed lately a passion for his society. The two men frequented the same clubs and transacted much official business together, but there had been nothing approaching intimacy between them. If the shrewd Westerner had given expression to his secret thoughts, they would have run somewhat in the following vein. Got a hangdog look about that off eye, which tells me he's a tarnation mean cuss on occasion. He's all good looks and soft solder. However, that don't worry me any. It's none of my funeral. I do not know what solder means, S-A-W-D-E-R. After the two men had exchanged the usual civilities, the latest political question looming up on the horizon was discussed. Finally, the conversation turned upon the coming ball. By the by, Senator, I wish I dared ask for cards for a friend of mine and his daughter. They have just arrived in town for the season and know no one. He, the father, is the newly appointed president of the Arrowhead Mines. The daughter is lovely, a fine foil for Miss Jewell, unexceptional people and all that. Certainly, General, the senator hastened to reply, what address? With profuse thanks, General Benson handed him a card on which appeared the name Henry C. Madison, Corcoran Building, Washington, D.C. Oh, so how now we've got a lot of characters here. So now we have Henry C. Madison, um, who has a daughter. There's apparently no mother in the situation. What is with the dead moms or the absent moms? I just saw this hair was wildly out of place. I mean, but really, I've got all the curls all the places. Okay, I will speak to Mrs. Bowen right away. <clears throat> Mrs. Bowen and Jewel were enjoying a leisure hour before dinner in lounging chairs before the blazing great fire in the former sitting room. There was a little purr of gratification from both women as they heard a well-known step in the hall. Well, here you both are, was Senator Bowen's greeting as he kissed his wife and daughter and flung himself wearily into a chair. Tired, asked his wife, yes. Some of these dumb-headed aristocrats are worse to steer into a good paying bit of business for the benefit of the government treasury than a bronking, than a bucking bronco. <laughs> dumb-headed aristocrats. <laughs> How late you are, Papa. Here broke in Jewel from her perch on her father's knee. What? I'm sorry. Let me finish the sentence before I am outraged. How late you are, Papa. Here broke in Jewel from her perch on her father's knee where she was diligently searching his pockets. It had been her custom from babyhood and never yet had her search been unrewarded. I'm sorry, there's a 20 year old woman sitting on her dad's knee searching his pockets. Am I the only one who finds this disturbing and that he's still putting stuff in his pockets for her to find like she was three? I, just, I mean, I wasn't married when I was 20, but I was with my husband. I can imagine sitting on his knee, not my, not my dad's, when I was 20. Oh. 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 All right. <clears throat> All right. Bowen is speaking. Oh. I have been here earlier. Only I met General Benson and he always has so many questions to ask, especially about my little lass and he kept me no end of time. Don't be wicked, Papa, smiled Jewel, because you spoil me. You think everyone must see me with your eyes. Ah, pet, it's just wonderful how well all the old and young single fellows know me since you have grown up. <laughs> yeah, they don't like old, young. If she's beautiful, they'll be like, mm-hmm. Uh, but we won't listen to him just yet, Blossom. Not even Sumner shall part us for a good bit. Your pa just can't lose you for a good spell, I reckon. 
No man shall part us, Dad. If he takes me, he must take the whole family, replied Jewel with the loving pat on the sallow cheek. Oh my gosh, and she's sitting on his knee, searching his pockets, saying, no man's ever gonna take me from you, and patting his face. Oh, I mean, maybe that was more common back then. I don't know, wow, my eyebrows. I have all the issues right now. <clears throat> Okay, so um, Bowen is speaking, I'm not Bowen. Yeah, Bowen, Zenus Bowen. Zenus Bowen is speaking again. We'll see, we'll, and okay, so sometimes I'm telling you who's speaking because when I pause, um, it's easy to forget, but also in literature, of, so now in literature, we are very accustomed to speaker tags most times the speaker changes. We'll have he said, she said, whatever. And those are the tags and it makes it easier to know who's speaking when. The literature of this time did not make as frequent use of speaker tags, even when there were more than two people having a conversation, like in the novel from today, we'll eliminate some of the speaker tags if it's just the two people having back and forth conversation, but not always with this literature. So sometimes it really is difficult to know who is talking. So when I pause, I do it to remind us of who's talking, but also to remind myself like, yeah, this is who's talking because there is not always something in the text that tells me that. So Zenas Bowen is speaking again. We'll see, we'll see. There's another bid for an invite to your shindig. I thought people saying invite instead of invitation was a recent thing, but apparently not. Does it bother anybody else? It bothers me. We'll see, we'll see. There's another bid for an invite to your shindig, he continued with a laugh as he tossed the card given him by General Benson into his wife's lap. It's mighty pleasant to be made much of. It's worthwhile getting rich just to see how money can change the complexion of things and how cordial the whole world can be to one man if he's got the spongilix. Interesting, that's just to see how money can change the complexion of things. Now we know in context, he's just saying the way people treat you, but I think we should think about this. How does money change the complexion of things? Like we have learned that Zenas Bowen looks like a Native American. Um, he's most likely has dark skin. He's walking around in a white man's world doing white man things. Perhaps because his money has changed the way people view his complexion. All right, so ooh, we have Mrs. Bowen speaking and it even says it. My dear Zenas said Mrs. Bowen, with a shake of her head and a comical smile on her face. Don't talk the vernacular of the gold mines here in Washington. You'll be eternally disgraced. Well, Mrs. Senator, I fit the enemy, tackled grizzlies, starved, been locked up in the pens of Libby prison, and I've come out, be I've come out first best every time. But this thing you call society beats me. The women make me dizzy, the men make me sick, and a mighty little of it makes me ready to quit fairly squashed. Them's my sentiments. A cry of delight broke from Jewel. Oh, dad, as she brought to view a package in a white paper. I guess she pulled it out of his pocket. Is she still on his lap? Oh my goodness. And while I have paused, um, Okay, so Mrs. Bowen, we, I'm still super curious about who she is. What was her name? Estelle, es, yes, Estelle. I got questions. All right, a cry of delight broke from Jewel. Oh, dad, as she brought to view a package in a white paper, Mrs. Bowen left her seat to join in the frolic that ensued to gain possession of it. Now they're frolicking all in his lap. At last, the mysterious bundle was unwrapped, the box opened, and a pearl necklace brought to view of wonderful beauty and value. The senator's eyes were full of the glint and glister of love and pride as he watched the faces of his wife and daughter. After a moment, he brought out another package, which he gave to his wife. There, Mrs. Senator, there's your diamond star you've been pining after for a month. I ordered them quite a while ago. Happened to be passing Smith's and stopped in, found them ready, and here they be. 
What women see in such gewgaws is a puzzler to me. I can tolerate such hankering in a youngin, but being you're not a chicken, Mrs. Senator, and not in the market, and still good looking enough to make any man restless with no ornaments but a clean calico frock, your fancies are a conundrum to yours truly. But these women folks must be humored, I suppose. Oh my gosh, that's his attempt at dad humor. I mean, that was sweet. He's like, you can have no adornments and men will still be falling all over the place for you. But oh, to be a man, I guess you got to buy the women the jewelry. Ha <laughs> ha ha, hearty har har. Ah, with this, the senator, senator plunged into his dressing room, which adjoined his wife's sitting room, and began the work of dressing for dinner and the theater. Cuthbert coming, he called to his daughter, who still lingered. Yes, Papa. Jewel, dear, have Venus be particular with your toilet tonight. I will overlook you when she has finished. See, that was clearly Mrs. Bowen speaking, but there was no indication. Cuthbert coming, he called to his daughter, so we know it's Senator Bowen. Yes, Papa, we know it's Jewel because she calls him Papa. And then Jewel, dear, have Venus be particular with your toilet tonight. I will overlook you when she has finished. That's clearly a mom talking. But no, no speaker tag. That the name of your new maid, Blossom? The senator's voice demanded. There were many grunts, groans, and growls issuing from the privacy where his evening toilet was progressing because of refractory collar buttons and other unruly accessories. Yes, Papa, hmm. Name enough to hang her. Venus, the goddess of love and beauty. Can she earn her salt? Okay, so her new maid is Venus. We keep getting new people introduced. Um, who is Venus? Is Venus also mysteriously 20 years old? What is Venus's background? I'm intrigued by Venus's name, the goddess of love and beauty. So, so I mean, clearly I'm always on the hunt for who is Hagar's daughter. I don't know, maybe it's Jewel, maybe it's Venus. I don't know, I have my guesses, but what really stopped me here in um, House Behind the Cedars by Charles Chestnut, it's this book, House Behind the Cedars by Charles Chestnut, there is a character named Marina and she goes to this uh, jousting thing. Anyway, you should listen to the reading of this, it's on YouTube, but, um, she earns the title of goddess of love and beauty her name wasn't venus though but venus is the goddess of love and beauty and this was written in uh, like 1901 maybe let's see um 1900 it was published uh hagar's daughter i think we said was Published in 1903. Let's look and see. Nope, 1901. 1901. Um, I know that Hopkins and Chestnut were contemporaries. I believe they traveled in similar circles. I am very curious if this goddess of love and beauty reference is a nod to Chestnut's work. And um, if it is, then I would say then yes, Venus is Hagar's daughter because Rena in Chestnut's work was also the daughter of, um, well, the woman was not enslaved, but of a black woman and a white man who had lived as husband and wife. So anyway, that's interesting. I love to find these kinds of connections in different things. And also I have, the song I know is by Bananarama, but I also know that it was a remake, but I don't know who did the original. But the song, I'm your Venus, I'm your fire, your desire. Do, 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 God is on the mountain top. Okay burning like a silver flame summit of beauty and love venus was her name Woo! she's got it yeah baby she's got it okay 
Um, so anyway, Venus is her new maid. All right, huh, name enough to hang her. Venus, the goddess of love and beauty, can she earn her salt? He appeared at the door now, struggling into an evening vest. He employed no man, declaring no valet de, cha de chamber would, should boss him around. I'm stopping here because valet de chamber is V-A-L-E-T, is valet. This here is spelled valley, V-A-L-L-E-Y. There is probably some usage that those spellings are interchangeable, but I that's unusual to me. All right. He employed no man, declaring no valet de chamber should boss him around. He'd always been free and didn't propose to end his days in slavery to any slick pated fashion plate who didn't know the color of gold from the inside of a brass kettle. Um, so let's stick with he'd always been free and didn't propose to end his days in slavery. He is being euphemistic. He is employing hyperbole. But again, authors choose these words very deliberately. So let's keep that in mind. I don't know what I would do without her. Okay, so apparently Jewel is speaking again. I don't know what I would do without her. I have been intending to speak to you for some time concerning her brother. He is a genius. And Venus has given up her hopes of becoming a school teacher among her people to earn money to help develop his talents. Can't we do something for them, Papa? I have said nothing to her yet. Okay, so Venus has given up her hopes of becoming a school teacher among her people. So clearly her people are different than Jules' people, or maybe they're not. We don't know, we don't know, we don't know, but we know that the assumption is that Venus's people are different than Jules' people, and it's probably safe to assume that Venus is black whether or not she actually looks black. And she has a brother. That's fascinating. I'm intrigued. Um, he's a genius who has talents to develop. I wonder what kinds of talents. Let's keep reading. Huh. We're back to Mr. Bowen. Huh. You're always picking up lame animals, Blossom. Dang, lame animals. I mean, she's smart enough to be a school teacher and her brother's a genius. Are they lame animals or are they simply constrained by their social circumstances? Hmm. Huh. You're always picking up lame animals, Blossom. From a little shaver, it's been the same. If you keep it up in Washington, you'll have all the black beggars in the city ringing the area bell. However, I'll look into the matter. If the girl ain't too proud to go out as a servant to help herself along, there may be something in her. And the chapter thus ends abruptly. So that was the end of chapter 10 in Hagar's Daughter by Pauline Hopkins. This is Rashonda's reading room and I'm Rashonda Cade.